Sziasztok! Welcome to Graphisoft. It's good to see you here tonight. This event is a collaboration between three participants, the Digital Architecture Meetup Group, the UX Budapest Meetup Group and Graphisoft. And uh, it's a pleasure to host it for the first time, and I hope it's not the last. Uh, regarding the context, so as you might know, uh, we developed the ARCHICAD, which is a CAD software for architects. Therefore, many architects uh, work at the company and uh, uh, we has emerged a special or a unique blend of architecture and uh, UX in our work. And we are excited to share some details about it. I hope you, find, you will find it interesting and useful. Uh, Agi and Peter uh, will walk through the agenda and the topics we will cover. And uh, last but not least, after the presentations, we invite you for uh, conversations with some refreshments, including snacks and beverages, which you will find uh, outside of this room, uh, close to the entrance. So uh, please stay after the presentations. And uh, yeah, uh, I think we can jump into it. And I pass the mic to Aggie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy, for the warm introduction, and uh, uh, thank you to Graphisoft as well uh, for this uh, whole event and for the uh, support. Uh, hi, I am Agi Gashitz, and together with Dori Salai, <laughs> uh, we are the co-organizers of the Digital Architecture Meetup Group. And uh, since I am an architect and uh, I moved to UX design, it was only a matter of time to reach out to the world famous UX Budapest Meetup Group and ask them to organize an event together with them. And today, as Andy mentioned, is the first, but hopefully not the last event together. Uh, so what we're gonna have tonight, uh, we will have two amazing presentations on the connection between architecture and UX design and we will focus on how to design a great software for architects and also for engineers. And we will highlight some difficulties and also the high expectations and the high pressure and how to manage it. And um, after each presentation, we're going to have a Q&A session. And don't be shy, ask your questions. Uh, and as Andy mentioned before, uh, Please don't go anywhere after the presentations and stay with us for a super casual uh, conversation and do some connections <laughs> with us. And today I also have my daughter here, Hannah. Uh, she is the youngest in the crowd and uh, I'm super proud that she is here with us tonight. And I think that's it. Uh, let me introduce to you the first presenter, Dido. And Dido, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Okay, let's kick start the presentation with a question. Does anyone know about this building, where it is? Anyone? Can we know where the architects are here? With a raise of hand. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is uh, the Library of Alexandria in Alexandria, Egypt, and it's the modern rebirth of uh, the ancient Alexandria. And it was uh, open to the public in 2002. I was about 11 years old when this was open to the public, and the first time I entered this building, I was like Harry Potter visiting Hogwarts for the very first time. I was amazed, really, because it, it's such a masterpiece and timeless. And, and of course, we don't have so much modern buildings in Alexandria. I remember also that reading about the concept of the building, each and every single part is, is conveying a story. So the southern wall of the building was, uh, of course, for environmental reasons. We have a lot of sun in Egypt, but also it, it, uh, um, it has a single letter from each and every modern and ancient a language in, in the globe. Also, the whole shape of the building looks like a disk rising from the water to convey uh, the knowledge across the globe. Of course, it's maybe big words, but still it, it's the meaning is, is quite profound. 
and even the interior of the building with these cascading platforms and uh, uh, the natural diffused light uh, overlooking and lighting the, the reading rooms, such a masterpiece. And uh, of course, while we have good uh, uh, examples of also nicely designed buildings in Alexandria, that's re not really you know, the usual uh, scene that we see in Alexandria. Unfortunately, that's more or less what we see on a day-to-day -day life. And of course, a building like Alexandria Library, when it was opened, it's really changed the perception of the whole city for a whole generation. So in my opinion, that one better design building can change a city's perception for generations. Imagine, for instance, that Budapest doesn't have the Budapest parliament. Ah, I think the, the whole done would be, you know, lacking. So of course, one better bu design building can really make a big impact. Uh, the whole topic of the presentation for me is about telling briefly my story and journey from switching to an architect to a UX designer. And let's, you know, jump and ride the highs and lows of my journey together. So I, I graduated from my bachelor degree in architecture in 2013. Good to know that in Egypt, the bachelor degree is five years or three like here. I don't know why, but the thing that the more we stay in, in you know, the nightmares of, of undergraduate studies as an architect, the more we learn better. I'm not sure it's about this case, but anyway, in 2016, shortly after I graduated, I had to do one year of uh, mandatory conscription in, in the military. And lucky me, I was working as an architect. So I also, after I finished the service, uh, I had the first commission as a very young architect to design my first uh, and realized public building. And uh, shortly about that, uh, usually the, the military in Egypt is, of course, building so many uh, uh, buildings, not only for military personnel, but also public housing for uh, uh, affordable, uh, as an affordable solution for the public. So of course, you can see somehow the similarity, at least in the color tone. Of course, it doesn't, I'm not so proud about, you know, what we have, but that's an example of what the military buildings and when I get the commission, of course, I was quite excited, but at the same time, quite scared because still I'm young and I have to, you know, deal with these uh, uh, dynamics of dealing with, of course, difficult clients because the, these were military generals. And somehow I tried to manage to, you know, create a, a nice and uh, uh, visually uh, at least appealing building. But at this, at this time of, of uh, uh, when, when the building was open again and when, when it was realized, I felt that it, that's my first child, you know, seeing the building grow and, and you created it, did the sketches and seeing the building realized it's such a great uh, feeling. But looking at it right now, after I did my studies here in Budapest and after I saw, of course, the details and super nice uh, architecture here in Budapest and all over Europe, I would do a lot of things, you know, in a different way. Uh, I still practice architecture as uh, as a hobby, let's say it this way. So I participate in competitions. Uh, for instance, this uh, snow museum was held by a Ruki and construction company uh, in, in Finland. And I never saw snow or ice, yet I managed to, you know, design a snow museum and I was among the top five finalists. So lucky me, but that was something at least for me. And, and this also bring the impression that you don't have to be living in the context to know what, you know, these people of this environment would, you know, expect as a good architecture. And that was, of course, proved earlier by, by Sunita when they designed the Alexander Library and uh, many other competitions. And I'm still participating. But while I still love uh, the, uh, the field of architecture, I wouldn't take it as a profession. I, it's very, very difficult after, maybe because I wasn't lucky with my first, you know, commission building and dealing with difficult clients and difficult uh, uh, contractors. I felt that there is a need that, okay, start shifting my career. And in 2016, as I mentioned, uh, after my first building was realized, I convinced my brother to shift towards UX design. He was still uh, studying architecture, but they ha he had the chance to shift towards UX design. And I convinced him, yeah, definitely, architecture isn't what 
we dreamed of. It, it's much more difficult and reality hits hard. So please, if you can, shift towards your uh, uh, IT and UX design. And later on in 2020, during the pandemic, since I already decided, okay, let's make a shift toward UX design. Uh, I started my PhD uh, studies in BME. I'm still doing it, hopefully in the last semester, just hopefully, we'll see. Uh, my brother convinced me to shift towards UX design. So only four years and we both shifted toward UX design, but I think it was for the better good. So let's then talk about architects and UX designers. Since during uh, 2020, between 2020 and 2021, I was both working as an architect and starting to shift slowly toward UX design. And what are the similarities between the two professions? First, for the uh, architects among us in the audience, what is UX design? UX design is the process of designing mostly digital products which look good and of course visually are appealing and uh, emotionally resonant so the user gets attached to the product somehow and which is the feel of the product and of course easy to use which is the usability uh, and how did i learn about ux design when i decided to, to shift uh, of course interaction design foundation is a very, a very uh, well established uh, foundation uh, of course uh, offering a lot of uh, theoretical uh, UX design courses, among others. Uh, the Nelson Mon Norman groups, if you are a UX designer, of course, you know about Don Norman and Jacob Nelson, the pioneers of UX design, the ones who actually coined the term, and they are offering, of course, professional uh, certificates and uh, articles, in detail articles that you can always uh, go back to when, whenever you need them. And uh, I think, the major shift happened when I did the Google UX design certificate because it was also practical and you also do uh, UX design projects and, and, and of course you are judged with uh, uh, your peers and, and, and some of the mentors. And what was reassuring about the Google UX design certificate is that two uh, of the instructors of uh, uh, Google were actually architects who shifted to UX design. So that was quite reassuring for me that, okay, I'm, I'm going into the right steps. And uh, as a matter of fact, in 2022, the Interaction Design Foundation did a survey uh, with 1,300 uh, 1, uh, UX professionals. And uh, among the top uh, 10 fields that shift to UX, architecture is the seventh. So it's quite common to see in design teams uh, uh, architects working as UX designers. Uh, so what are the similarities between both? So, of course, both architects and UX designers follow a design process because they are in the process of creation. They work in multidisciplinary teams and they deal with clients and stakeholders. For architects, of course, they are working. I'm, I'm, I'm repeating, of course, so many times. Sorry about that. But yeah, so uh, architects are designing physical spaces but uh, they're long, uh, they, have, they are usually working on long design cycles, designing a building and passing through the different phases. It takes a lot of time, but UX designers are usually designing digital spaces, digital products, and uh, the cycles are much shorter. What are the happy moments? Um, imagine if you are an architect, you get the commission for a new building, and this you know, start the revelation phase, I would say. You start imagining and dreaming about the building, how it would look like and how the materials would fit together, how the people interact inside the spaces. And I can also say the same for UX designers. So imagine if you are getting a, a task or a commission to design a new website for a product of some sort. And then, of course, again, you start, you know, uh, ideating and, and doing doing this revelation phase in, inside your mind and what, what can look the website look like so let's take a quick break with a question so can whether you are an architect or a ux designer can you say any sentence that could disturb an architect or ux designer annoy them in any way yes please yes yes architect or ux designer yeah nice nice Good one, exactly. So yeah, the, you just need to draw it or, you know, there are a lot of examples actually. So we have a budget cut, 
whether you are already in the design phase and someone says this, it, you know, might hurt you. Also, you can use my sketches. I have a client who is sketchy. And use, you can use my sketches. The new deadline is undefined, you know, and, and of course it gets longer and, and you start to worry. It's just a small change, you know, just a tiny one and it will be good. And I don't like it. The one that I hate the most, if some, you show a design, someone says, I don't like it. Okay, give some reason, some context, but I don't like it. It's just too much. So yeah, we can see that uh, both uh, UX designers and uh, architects also pass through the difficult times. Uh, imagine if you are an architect and you design a really nice building and then you show this to that structural engineer and say, oh, okay, that won't work. That's really not feasible. And exactly the same can happen if you are a UX designer and then the developer engineer would tell you the same, you know, that will cost a lot and then it, it hurts. Of course, again, if you are an architect and you see the building and the details are coming up together and suddenly you're worried that what about the last piece? Would it fit? Would it not? And, and you start getting these worries. And if you are a UX designer, when once the product is being launched, you are also worrying whether the whole experience is well planned or not. Okay, now let's shift to UX design. Uh, so as I mentioned in 2020, I started learning about UX design and uh, uh, started by designing medical web apps, a bit too far from archite uh, architecture, but it was nice between, you know, medical dashboards and, and, and uh, dentist uh, layout for clients or, or uh, back office uh, again dashboard. It was a challenge. It was a good shift to do, but at the same time, I still felt that I lost my domain knowledge. You know, I, I have been working as an architect for a long time, and just because, as a good man said, just because you fit, uh, uh, just because you fit in, doesn't mean that you are in the right place. So, you know, th and that's what what exactly I felt when I was there. That okay, I I feel that. You know, UX design is a nice career and I'm enjoying it, but I, I didn't feel really that I'm in the right place. And that's why I, I was constantly looking for a, a, a professional career opportunity where I can use my domain knowledge. So what is exactly domain knowledge? It's the understanding of a specific area. This can be from your educational background, of course, or from your uh, uh, professional experience when you work at, at, in, a, in a field. Of course, that's definitely uh, um, uh, a domain knowledge and even if you are, are having a hobby you can be domain expert in fishing or, or in painting or in cooking so that's basically the domain knowledge and fun fact that in july 2021 i attended my first ux meetup and it, it, the title of it was open air ux blankets and uh, this is my second ux meetup so that is uh, and i'm a speaker so that that's you know Good to know. And yeah, in October 2021, I joined Graphisoft. But in this meetup, uh, Yuri Juhas, some of you may know him. Uh, he's our UX mentor here. And he was a speaker in this uh, UX meetup. And of course, once he started telling his story, how he joined Graphisoft very early on and I started talking about Graphisoft. I know Graphisoft because I was an architect and of course, definitely I went there after the meetup to, you know, start talking to him and ask him about how work, things work in, in Graphisoft and very uh, shortly I joined Graphisoft. Uh, so yeah, let's let's discuss how this happened actually. And in, in, I mean in Graphisoft. So Graphisoft is pioneering the domain experience and, and or expertise. Let me explain this. If you know, Gabor Boyar is the one who founded uh, uh, Graphisoft in 1982. It was founded uh, as a, a 3D modeling software, uh, mainly for pipes for the Paksh uh, uh, um, nuclear plant. And later on, it was developed as uh, a software for 3D modeling for architects. And uh, he was mentioning in his book, The Graphisoft Story, that by the third version, they already knew that they had to have uh, a domain expert in, in, inside the company. So working for architects without knowing their workflows and their experience and experiences and expectations while they are doing the modeling is quite difficult. And that's why uh, only in the third version, uh, Judy Joe has was the first domain expert. 
and later on he joined as an architect first and then later on he joined uh, 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 became the ui or user interface designer at, because ux designer wasn't uh, even a uh, term back then when he joined uh, i can also let's uh, explain how the design team evolved uh, across uh, the history since Yuri was uh, had joined uh, Graphisoft. So in 1990, 50, the design leader, of course, was Yuri. We had two architects and a product designer all working as UX designer. The design tools were quite primitive. They were using pen and paper and, and uh, Photoshop and even the design methods. So in 1995, they went, you know, design thinking methodology or or well-defined methods so they were using intuition and exper expert opinion so be meeting with architects and asking whether these things would work or not and for the documentation they were using rich text file that's word basically and uh, in 2002 i jumped okay yeah, i go back so in 2002 the team was already growing but the methods were exactly the same it just doubled so uh, three architects and three product designer and already in 2012 the team was much bigger but it was named archicad development uh, uh, management and the product managers and the product designers were working in the same team and we had also katitsa as a ux writer the design methods were more of course uh, uh, developed we had usability tests user consultation and expert reviews and more refined ways of documenting the project. In 2017, the split happened and the product management were working in a separate team and the product design was working in a separate team. We had more refined uh, design methods and, and design tools. We had many or, or more design tools uh, right back then. It was Photoshop, Balsamic, Keynote, Illustrator, Inkscape, to name a few, they were more than that. But right now in 2024, and that's the structure of the, our design team. It's uh, the director of global design and UX. It's Mohakshi Bitar. And underneath we have, uh, let's say, five positions. So the design solutions team led by Andy, and we, uh, which is about 20 product design. Uh, we have principal product designer, uh, design services team, UX mentor, which is Yuri, and the global graphics design. Uh, you can also see that uh, the tools are reduced, which somehow shows that also the uh, the, process, uh, the design tools uh, being reduced means the tools itself are much more streamlined, but at the same time, the processes and the design methods are more refined, and we are using Confluence and Jira for uh, documentation. So, of course, once I joined uh, Graphisoft, I felt that, okay, finally, no wasted domain knowledge. I'm working uh, as an architect, as a UX designer, but uh, providing products for architects. So that's why the, the whole company is based on these products for architects by architects. For uh, It's now currently the global design team or the UX team is about 30% architects, but in other missions, the percentage go much higher. And like in customer success, we have 90% architects working there. And uh, briefly, uh, I would speak briefly about one of the design projects uh, as a UX designer, which is the design options feature uh, released in uh, September 20, uh, 2023, last year. And uh, it, it was for me the first big UX design project. There was about uh, six squads of developers working on this project. We were uh, three designers, one staff designer, Andras Fabian sitting there. And we also had me and, and Kafo Fujina uh, as the third designer. And of course, we had some challenges during the phase, but I will mention them very, very briefly. So first challenge is the existing solution. If you are designing a feature which isn't existing anywhere in the market, it's of course opening so many ideas and you are you know, inventing a new solution. But if, you are, if there are existing solution, the challenge would be you are always comparing your design with this existing solution. And sometimes also the product managers might think that this is the solution we need because it's working for that company or that product. So we also need it somewhere. Yeah, so that's the first challenge. And of course, work, uh, workflow preferences. So uh, for all architect, uh, architects and, and architecture firms, 
the iteration process is different. Some would do the iteration process in different files. Some would do it in the same file in different uh, pages or, or in different layouts, or some would do it only in the early design stage and others would do it later in the documentation. So of course, these workflow references were challenging. And the feature naming, we spend at least two, three good weeks just on the naming of a very tiny uh, thing in the interface. So that also was a good challenge. So whether it's design options or variations or or, or uh, variants, and we, we spend a lot of time just on this. So even if you decided to hire a domain expert, we, we also come with, with some risks that you might keep in mind. We are somehow biased by our own expertise. So we had, you know, passed through uh, either it's at educational level or, or professional level, we had our own uh, preferences. As this might lead to failure to, you know, uh, uh, um, um, correlate with with the, with what the user uh, expects or the user needs. We think somehow that we know what the user needs, but this is isn't always the case. Uh, attachment uh, maybe to existing solution that we have been using or existing workflows that we also used, and detail fixations. So we we might uh, go very deep in in a very tiny detail. But it, it doesn't really matter in the, in the overall experience because again we are somehow sometimes self-absorbed with what our own experiences are, and this might all these three might lead to miscommunication with our colleagues or with other uh, colleagues in other teams. So how did, does Graphisoft you know mitigate these dangers? First, we have the Design Operations Council. Uh, they the, their responsibility is to define uh, 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 processes in a way to mitigate this risk. We have also the Product Experience Council. Mainly it's about the coherency of, of uh, the experiences across uh, multiple products. And we have a technical one-on-one, -on -one, and that's the principal product designer job. He meets with mostly most of the designers uh, to really go into the details of uh, the feature being designed by this designer. And since he's the one seeing all other uh, uh, features design, he can also see whether something is inconsistent or and based, of course, in experience he can suggest. And of course, we have people one on one. It's generally about tasks and, and communication with their colleagues or also. Uh, um, uh, well, the colleagues or the other team members and uh, finally the feedback loop, which is Coming next in detail, Rini will talk in detail about the feedback loop that we have here uh, during design. So to wrap things up, uh, just as a summary, uh, everyone has their own journey. I, I shared with you my journey shifting between architecture and UX design, and I felt guilty in the beginning because I was, you know, comparing myself to my colleagues that, you know, okay, I, I'm starting from scratch. I'm starting as a junior, but I'm, you know. 30 something years old and this shouldn't be the case i every one of us should be you know focusing more on our impact that what we brings to the team and of course human centered design is the principle that drive both uh, uh ux design and architecture we both share a lot of things as we uh, seen in the presentation and if you are deciding to hire a domain expert try to establish a good feedback system for domain experts to leverage their expertise and also to mitigate the risks. Very In the very beginning of the presentation, I mentioned this Alexandria Library and how this group of Norwegian architects made a huge impact. And I, I still, you know, talk about this building as a, uh, before I even was a, an architect, I still remember the first time I visited this building and my friends and I spending a lot of time in, in uh, Alexander Library and it, it definitely made a huge impact on, on uh, a whole generation and generations to come. We can also say that one better design digital product can make a huge impact on, on hundreds of users and we here at Graphics of trying to make an impact on 100,000 architects. So we also try here to create an impact. Thank you. Um, yes. And any questions? Thank you.
that's it. That's it. Okay, it's so can you for the, uh, thanks for the presentation. Thank and do you have any question regarding to the, those words? Uh, I would like to know from your experience what you do exactly to mitigate your own bias as an architect designing a, pro a product for architects. What do you do when you are working and what what you exactly think about it and what, how do you deal with that? Yes, that, that's a very good question because I, the, the project that I mentioned, design options, and Antosh also remember this. Um, since I was, uh, that was the very f uh, first big project, I was of course absorbed with the other uh, you know product and this was my experience basically uh, if we have this you know feedback loop that we have it will always you know somehow uh, uh, limit these biases so um, i I'm, I'm biased by my own experience but when i'm hearing you know more experienced designers uh, feedback whether in, in design review and, and of course then you will list all these uh, uh, you know workshops or, or ceremonies that we have I get the feedback that okay in in our software in Archicad this won't work so it took me time I would say but at the same time now that I'm you know a more experienced UX designer definitely looking at multiple solutions is a good thing to know what the market offers and, and get ideas but with more experience it you know these biases I would say dissolving so yeah So, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So, uh, so, Mohamed, you are quite a new designer, right? I mean, I mean, just, yes. and a lot of junior designers or designer wannabes, career switchers, wants to be a UX designer. What do you think made you succeed in in really getting an opportunity to become? Ah, uh, okay. Well, it's. It's a tough one, but I, I first I'm I think I'm lucky because only after one year I could join Graphisoft. And that, that was a dream. Actually, I applied to Graphisoft as a technical support engineer back in 2017. I, I was, you know, studying my master's here and I couldn't join because I wasn't that good in Archicad. So imagine being a technical support engineer in a software you can't use. Oh so, yes. But yeah, so uh I would say I was lucky also because my brother also helped me a lot. So having a mentor is a very important thing. So uh, we are also uh, uh, with my brother now. We are also having juniors with us who help us in, in, in other, you know, design projects. But if you don't have a mentor, you basically start, you know, learning about the field. Maybe you do some projects, but you feel lost. What's the next step? Do you do, you know, initiative projects? And how, how do you run them and how do you reach the stakeholders? This might be the case. So if you start doing, you know, you check out, I don't know, the public transport application or, or something, you know, uh, designed for the social good as Google name it. If you start doing these projects, it might be good on the portfolio, but at the same time, you will still feel lost. So I, I remember, for instance, in, in the UX meetup, uh, that was repeated a lot that okay having a mentor or and there are a lot of uh, I, I think you better also do, are doing mentorship on yeah. the ADP list as, as far as I know so there are a lot of opportunities right now for juniors to learn from mentors even for free and and I think this is the best way so having a mentor is yeah the solution I think any more questions Thank you. I've got two questions. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned your processes in which you develop the way you develop your UX designs. At what stage do you involve your developers? Because do you complete your designs and then at very last stage do you involve them or is it earlier stages so you get early feedback? So you, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we start by having a high level design and this doesn't have to look good and it doesn't have to be detailed. We do some feedback from other designers or from, we have uh, uh, the insiders panel, about 170 uh, uh, Graphisoft uh, user. 
and we can quickly test you know our concepts and, and you know uh, do some validation and afterwards we of course move on uh, sadly we can't really do you know a quick prototype in archicad it's it's legacy software it, it, it takes a lot of time to uh, uh, develop an actual working prototype but now that we have figma you don't really need it so usually quick prototype and test it with users and it's good to go so yeah and second one is yeah. which one is more enjoyable do you miss being an architect or ux is satisfying your creativity uh, absolutely enjoy being a ux designer and i still miss sometimes being an architect but since architecture competitions you know remove the hassle of working with clients and <laughs> stakeholders and contractors later on i still participate in design competitions but as a career i think ux design is the one to go thank you thank you any more questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Can I ask what is your PhD about? Yes, definitely. I started it since it's in the Faculty of Architecture. I started something relevant to mass housing, which I showed a photo of it. For me, it's you know shocking now that I'm living here in Hungary. But uh, uh, I shifted it towards uh, uh, evaluating AI tools for architects, and somehow. Since the evaluation is not just about usability or, or uh, evaluation for the sake of evaluation, but rather if these tools can fit for uh, mass customization, mass housing customization. Since the majority of AI tools are basically built for housing, that's why I saw it fit to do this. Thank you. Any more questions? I have one. Okay, sure. Uh, have you ever used uh, Graphi? Uh, RECAD for wireframing? Uh, yes, we do. So <laughs> we use it as a base, like screenshots. So uh, and and of course, yeah, like it's it's a working application, so we can easily, you know, remove some things and, uh -huh. and so on. So we use it, but it's we we are trying to use it carefully because if it looks already as like you know a working prototype, our users that we are testing with would be you know rushing into doing other things. So we try in, in the early stage to make it as low fidelity as possible. Uh -huh. And that's why we have a low fidelity, low fee Archicad kit. Uh -huh. And later on, we can test on the, you know, high fidelity UI kit, which looks like Archicad exactly. Uh, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about usability testing. Uh, I know that architects are really busy people, and how do you <laughs> get them to participate in your test? Uh, well, actually, TB can answer this question because he's the one who did this whole insiders panel, but I can. No, 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 please. Because, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, well, yeah, it was a really difficult uh, uh, task to do because in the beginning we were really suffering recruiting people and we had an Excel sheet where we had some contacts uh, who signed some agreement that they will not talk about this internal uh, processes and stuff, but that was not really working. Uh, so about one and a half year ago, two years ago, more or less, we established a program where we were recruiting uh, on our community forum uh, users to, to participate in an insider program. Of course, we have had to make sure that we keep them engaged. So we were offering some webinars and stuff so they can get a better insights what's going on under the hood. But in, in uh, exchange, we wanted them to participate in usability tests. So this is how we could get them. And, and now it happens that like in a week, we can easily recruit some people all over the world. So not only Hungarian architects, but uh, international architects. And also we have some budget, of course, for, uh, for um, what is it called? Incentives. Um? Incentives? Uh, yeah, to, to, you know, give some vouchers, for example, um, and stuff like this. But yeah, they, they are happy to come. I mean, they are, I think they are the most enthusiastic about our products, and that's why they are also enjoying getting involved in the development phase. Yeah, welcome. So, hi. Um... Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation, Dido. I really liked it. It was 
I, I, I couldn't really stress because of my own presentation, because I was listening to yours. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, feedback dynamics and basically how to utilize your design team's knowledge um, so that you can move forward uh, with, with your project. And just a super quick intro. So I'm Reni and I'm working at Graphisoft for seven or eight years as a product designer. But just to reflect on Dido's presentation, so I'm not an architect. I studied industrial design, then shifted to graphic design and then to product design a bit later on. And I think that we can jump into our topic. So uh, you might be familiar with our product, but basically we have four uh, main products. Uh, the most popular one is Arricad and, and all of us are uh, all of the, those products are CAD softwares and they are serving engineers and, and architects. And besides our product, we also have a lot of add-ons, extensions, plugins, and some additional content what can serve the workflow of the engineers and, and architects. And also we have a lot of related services. So we have some learning portals, community forums, some offline online events we also have you know web shops where you can purchase our products and so on and uh, it's not surprising but you know everything is connected to everything so at the end it can seem like a, a huge intertwined mess but uh, let's call it rather a complex ecosystem <laughs> and um, so we as designers need to uh, handle these things and this is just a reminder of, of Dido's presentation. So our design team is consists of about 40 people and most of us are product designers, but we have a pretty diverse team. So there are a lot of experts in our team. And, and we are the one who are working on the design projects of this complex ecosystem. And so at the end, we, we end up like, you know, this. It's like when, when you when you try to juggle a lot of uh, aspect expectations limitations dependencies between these these products and solutions and i think that this might be super familiar to you so i think that all of you experience something very similar and i actually grouped the things based on um, um so the colors means that the black ones are more about generic ux ui expectations or aspects and the blue ones uh, uh, can be familiar for those who are using Archicad. So the, those are more specific for, for Archicad. And, um, you know, I think that the, that person can be me or it can be you or it can be all of us. And we are definitely not uh, dancing. So that's pure but sweet struggle, what you can see there. So how, how, do, we make, how do we make sure that we thought of everything? So I think that there are some pretty obvious and classic answers. Of course, with, with a lot of research, user validation, interviews, data analysis, and so on. But there, I think there is another aspect as well. So you can also utilize your in-house team to, to speed up your projects and to gather feedbacks, to iterate on your projects, and to involve experts. And I think that both of them has their own advantages and disadvantages, but today I will talk about this one. So the in-house part, the, the research could have been also um, a different topic and uh, I will start by showing you a few case studies where we were discussing some features and designs between each other and how it turned out. So here my first example is uh, called um, the AI visualizer add-on for Archicad. It's as the name suggests it's an AI uh, based image generator tool, which can create amazing renderings based on your written prompt in Archicad. And it's a quite a new add-on. And on the left side, you can see some early stage designs. And on the right side, you can see some actual screenshots, what was uh, at the end, uh, the design. And here you can spot some differences. So for example, we started with this predefined styles over there, so no written prompts, and we had a creativity slider, which sounds, I think, mystical. What could it mean to have a creativity slider? <laughs> and uh, but in the end, we ended up with a more complex interface. So it's very familiar to all of the AI image generator tools. So 
you write a prompt, you push some buttons, some sliders, you click on the generate button, and you will get an amazing result. So I think that here the key takeaway is, you know, uh, you know the saying that less is more, but less is not always more. So in some in some cases, it's it's better to use a, let's say, a more complex UI because that gives the user more control, and they might be familiar already with this kind of new technologies. Technologies. And the second example, it's about attribute management in Arcad. Basically, it's a list interface and you can add new items to the list. So, and you can also manage the list items. And uh, here on the bottom, you can see the way how we used to manage these list items. So, so we used to have, it was basically a guideline in our design guides that, that this is the pattern what we need to use for such uh, management interfaces. And the new item, and the new folder actions were merged into the same button under a split button. But uh, we kind of discovered that, okay, that's, that's a nice and minimal solution over there, but uh, it makes it mm, difficult to discover the new folder option. So we revisited this uh, pattern and we changed it. So basically what happened here is that um, we, we created, you know, you know, a new normal or new pattern for uh, our guidelines. So I think that here the, the takeaway is that you can have impact on legacy guidelines uh, for your um, products or for your design system as well. And uh, why we are doing our projects, <laughs> we, we always do a lot of official, unofficial review and discussions. And I kind of started to, to spot some patterns so there are some recurring, um, let's say, group dynamics. There are some recurring um, opinion types and characters, personality types during these meetings. And, and also some recurring comment types, what you get when you are gathering feedback from your colleagues. So I came up with an idea that, OK, let's call these, um, these persons feedback personas. So uh, I was talk a bit about the so-called feedback personas. So they are personality types who will hold different opinion when you ask their feedback during a feedback session. And it's, it's not a scientific method, it's just a very personal something what I came up with. And um, yeah, let's see who we have here. So I know it, <laughs> it might sound funny, but for example, we have here the supporting, supporting friend over there. You, you know, they are the ones who will tell you that, that your design is okay and everything is going to be awesome. So we, we love them because of their positive vibe. <laughs> then we have the skeptic sage, which is um, more down to earth. And <laughs> they will say you that, oh, it's probably not feasible and you won't solve the real problem. But because of them, we kind of can improve our structural and logical thinking. So we absolutely need them. And then we have the visionary type. Uh, they are the ones who will tell you totally crazy ideas during your, during your feedback sessions. And they will also tell you ideas which are super far from your project scope at all. And they will always challenge you to, you know, think in the bigger picture. So they will kind of push you <laughs> out from your comfort zone. And that's why, again, we totally need them. Then we have the inside inspectors, who are the ones who say that, no, you can't do that without proper research. You need to test everything. You need to do interview for every single button and pixels and so on. But because of them, we are actually, you know, more well prepared to do proper research for and, and looking for actually viable uh, feedbacks. And then we also have the pixel police. You might be familiar with them. They are the ones who will always spot if you haven't used the right color code or you haven't used the right font in your design. So it's you cannot hide <laughs> any mistake uh, from them. But because of them, uh, your design will be visually consistent at the end. So I think that the learning here is that, that you need all of them to make sure that your project is good. And uh, why we are working on projects, we are kind of have a lot of methods, ceremonies and strategies. And I kind of uh, realized that we are kind of meeting with these persons in, in different ceremonies. So we have a lot of uh, 
type of meetings where, where you can gather a lot of um, feedbacks for different levels. And here I would like to ask you a question because I might align my presentation a little bit. So have you been organized a so-called design critique or design review session in the past few years? So if yes, please raise your hand. There are some unsure <laughs> raised hands. Okay, thank you. Um, in this case, I will talk about these ones a bit briefly, and then I will talk a little bit more about our design critique sessions. So we have our supporting friend here. Um, we are having this so-called design unit, which means that the 40 people of us, we are grouped into super small groups, and we are having weekly two hour long sync sessions. Those are unmoderated friendly meetings and it's um, basically you can share your challenges with each other in a, in a very safe environment. And also we have some different type of meetings. So we have a little bit more official meeting, um, a more official ceremony, which is these uh, weekly design team sync, let's call them. We also have a funny name for it, but it, it doesn't make any sense in English, so <laughs> I, I will just skip it. So in that case, the whole design team is present, so about 40 members, and we have six presentations each week, about six presentations, and it has a quite tight agenda, and it's a moderated, uh, moderated meeting, so it's different than the design units. And we also have domain experts, and domain experts can be consulted in a one-on-one -on -one method as well. And they are always, you know, ready to jump into any project and help you out, and they can help you speed up your project because their knowledge is just so huge that they will tell you a lot of super valuable feedback within a super short time. But about the design reviews, so um, we are having this framework of design reviews. These are very, very... I think similar to design critics, but we aligned it a little bit and we also selected a different name for it because we prefer this one. During these sessions, so these are ceremonies or on-demand meetings, um, we are having a lot of participants there and those are no brainstorming sessions, so those are not ideation sessions. And usually we are having a workflow overview and we focus on usability. Uh, issues. And it's also, I think, a very important thing that the facilitator is a different person than the presenter, because that's, this is way more efficient this way. So our design review formula is the following. You can see there our schedule. What you can see is that it's a pretty strict schedule over there. And basically within this 60 minutes, you only have 50 minutes to show your design to the others. So again, these are um, on-demand meetings, but what you can request from your colleagues, and uh, that's the formula what we use. So within that 50 minutes, you need to show everything which, <laughs> which, which makes sense or which uh, should be presented to someone who is giving feedback to your project. Um, and also you need to involve the problem statement at the very beginning, and we also have a short individual note-taking session and after that we start to share our feedbacks with each other. Here we have some pretty special rules how to do this. So basically we always tell one comment at a time, so one statement and then we are going around in rounds. And there are again some rules which should be considered by the participants. So you should be, when you are telling someone a comment, you should be super objective, you should be super short and you should tell the presenter not, you know, not, obs uh, not ideas, but observations. And I think that's, that makes a big difference. And actually, it's not so easy to, to comment in this way. But what you will get, you will get a huge amount of feedback within a super limited amount of time. So about, I think, 40, 60 valuable comments are going to appear in your Miro or in your Figma design file. And you will also get fellow designers who are happy to be involved in your project. So I think it's, it's also a very effective way. And some pro tips. So I think if you have more design reviews within a project, that's, that's super beneficial. So you can have one for the low fidelity stage and one for the high fidelity stage. And you can also invite other stakeholders as well. So let's see two other super short uh, quick studies. 
or case studies, sorry. Um, so here again, on the left, you see an early mockup, and on the right, you see the actual uh, feature of ARCAD. It's called, again, design options. So they also mention this feature. So again, basically, this is a list interface where you can put there your design alternatives, um, I mean, from, from UI point of view. And at the very beginning, we, we had an idea that if you would like to put a new item to a list, you will get a pop-up. And on that pop-up, you will have a lot of data about what, what you can fill out if you want to. But at the end, we, we ended up uh, just removing that pop-up and we kind of streamlined how you add those items to the list. So we use this um, in-place editing and in-place adding instead of a pop-up. And also we realized that those pop-up contained a few parameters which were kind of a duplication of parameters what can be found elsewhere in the architect's uh, workflow. And I think that here the takeaway can be that if you introduce new parameters or new fields to your design, you need to make sure that those are not duplication from the user point of view, because maybe they have some other special workarounds, or maybe they solve that problem in a different way somewhere else, and we don't want to duplicate parameters because that's misleading or that's confusing. And another example, again, on the left, you can see some low fidelity mockup. It's a super ugly low fidelity mockup, but that's an actual review material. So it's it can be shown during a review, it's totally okay. And these uh, examples are of um, a license error dialogue. So it's a pretty serious issue what the user needs to handle in this case. And at the beginning, I wanted to be, you know, super cautious, like just put there some small dialogue with just some generic error messages, some tiny buttons and so on. But at the end, you know, it's it's not okay because this is a serious problem. So you can have a bigger <laughs> dialogue. You can you can create more visual hierarchy as well. And and also you need to make sure that you are aware of the emotional state of your users when they are facing this problem. And here it needs to be you know a little bit reassuring that you are actually able to solve that problem. And it's not okay to hide links and buttons between each. I mean, next to each other. So again, here it's it's a bit more complex dialogue, but probably it's more usable or more easy to understand in that situation where the user in, because the license problem is, yeah, it's a serious problem while you are using Archicad. Um, oh, yeah, and I think that uh, I collected the key takeaways here. So I think the first one is that embrace low fidelity. It's absolutely okay if it's ugly. It shouldn't be super beautiful when you are showing it to your colleagues. And also, I think it's a useful uh, skill to, to be able to give objective feedback to your colleagues. So practice to give objective feedback. That's a very powerful uh, skill. And it's not so easy, I think, to, to acquire. And uh, yeah, ask for review on different stages of your design. So it's a good strategy to, to ask for feedback on the low fidelity stage and also on the high fidelity stage. And also, I know it's trendy to hate meetings in general because no one want to be at meetings. But if you, if you create efficient meeting formulas, you will actually want to be there because those are useful. So don't afraid to create meeting formulas within your team. And yeah, I think that not every meeting should have been an email. So there are some things which couldn't be decided uh, otherwise. And just a bonus. So you can create your own feedback personas because it will also, you know, a little bit spice up your spice up your work mindset. And it can also help you to get to know the char characteristics of your design work. And I think that's just a good practice as well. And um, thanks for your time and thanks for listening to me. And I hope you find some inspiring thing here. And uh, I think that now it's time for the Q&A. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rani, for the presentation. Do you have any questions?
Hello, maybe I didn't catch this moment, but how do you uh, document uh, feedback during reviews? Because there may oh. can be many mm -hmm. yeah. uh, feedback. <laughs> uh, so mostly during our review sessions, we use Miro or Figma and all of the other participants should comment each one of their comments there. So you will find them directly in your Miro or Figma file. That, those are the tools which are we mainly using. If you don't want to use those tools, then we simply just, you know, ask every participant to write down their comments and later send it to the presenter or send it to a group chat. It depends, but Miro and Figma, you can comment there and we use that function. Could you please back to the go back to the formula, the meeting formula slides? Yeah. Thank you. This one. Yeah. And I have two questions about this. Yeah. And one of them is how does this sharing feedbacks work in practice? Like going around in rounds. What do you mean by that? That's one question. Uh. Um. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, I wasn't clear enough. So, uh, usually we are having you know these online calls. So not in an offline setup. And there we use Teams for that. And if you have any comments left, you just simply raise your hand. And the facilitator will say your name and then you say one statement. And then the facilitator will say the following one in the order. And you keep your hand raised until you finished with all of your comments. So it's like a never ending story, but we want, we would like to let everyone to speak this way. I so. see. And reactions come in batch or or there are no reactions at all? So, uh, no, at that time there are no reactions. So if you want to react on those, you have that part. <laughs> so there are the optional unmoderated discussions, but I think that in some cases these statements are so short and so clear that maybe it's not needed. There are some, you know, statements where definitely discussion mm -hmm. is needed, but those Basically, here during these meetings, you can find a connection point between designers that, okay, they had an amazing comment there, and I really should think about it. So you connect with them afterwards. Okay. And another would be really useful because the changes are quite profound between, yeah. you know, original plan yeah. and, and, and actual screenshot. Yeah. And uh, can you go to one of your, your, before after and share some of these objective short observations which are not ideas uh which uh, which which was there so that that was like more text bigger dialogue that was uh, no, not, not really so these are yeah you know i kind of simplified it so that we could fit <laughs> into to this 25 minutes um it's more like for example you will get that in this case you are facing a serious license problem and the call to actions, what you get is quit and refresh. What the hell? What should I do with them? So then you get a comment which says that neither quit or refresh is, is not about solving my problem. Mm -hmm. So it the comment shouldn't be like, I don't like the text refresh because it sounds, I don't know, old school or whatever. It should be like, it's, it doesn't give answer to my problem or something like this. Or if you, for example, I don't know, just don't like an icon over there. You shouldn't say that I don't like that icon, but you should say that maybe that so that icon is easy to misunderstood or it's not synchronized with the content next to it. But maybe it's too similar to an icon which is, you know, right next to it and it's not easy to discover the, the differences. So something like this. Mm -hmm. So it's not always so, you know, clear how to move forward. Basically, after a huge amount of comments, you just change the whole flow and you kind of can see the patterns that, okay, the visual hierarchy was off and things like this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. For the next question, I just see a facing problem here. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so really I was sure you are the that <laughs> Designer eye. Yeah. Any questions? Hi. Uh, how many of these uh, 
review sessions do you usually like facilitate or or do that uh, for one project? Uh, it depends. I mean, it depends on the scale of the project. So in some some cases, the project has so many subtopics that you maybe need more for each subtopic. But it's if it's a shorter project, you can you are over, you are maybe OK with one or one or two session. Maybe one of them is less formal than the other one. I think that, yeah, the more the better. Maybe that's that's not entirely true, but I think that in an ideal way for a, a medium sized project, probably you need two of these. One at the beginning and one at at the point when you already have some kind of concept of, of the solution in a more detailed, maybe more high fidelity way. But that's all. Am I answered your question? <laughs> Thanks. Everyone else? now we are finished thank you Rene, and thank you andy and thank you for the graphics soft we have some snacks and beverages and you can say bye to everyone yes thank you so if you have time just stay with us and uh yeah it's some uh conversation and have some snacks so thanks